My name's Bean. Uh, everyone calls me Bean. I've been called Bean for many years. Um, it's not my real name, but that's what patients call me. That's what doctors call me. Um, I am a kidney doctor like Tina, and um, Tina and I have trained together and known each other for many years and met at very, uh, a number of meetings. My particular area of interest um, is actually transplantation, kidney transplantation, and also another condition called vasculitis. And I actually came to FMD largely because of these two, because often when patients present with FMD or things are picked up on kind of scans, often they will ask me in Scotland, could this be vasculitis? Could this be something, or in the setting of transplantation, we can't take the kidney here because there's something strange going on here. What could this be? And so as Tina highlighted earlier, often this is picked up coincidentally when people might want to donate a kidney or if patients have presented with symptoms and people do a scan and think, this is not quite weird. Could this contribute to the uh, symptoms the patient has? So the case I'm going to present to you today is actually one of the first cases I had, and this is about 10 years ago now. So um, this, this chap, was a 30, uh, he was 35 at the time, and he was actually uh, a doctor, and he was away at a, a medical conference. I'm actually going to preface this by saying it's quite difficult speaking to an audience which is made up of patients and medical professionals. So what I've tried to do is what I say to you hopefully will be accessible to everyone, what might be on the slides, might explain a bit more in medical terms what I'm saying. So, but feel free to ask me any questions as I go along. So I do think that uh, you know not all of this is straightforward, whether you're a patient or a doctor. So he was away at a medical conference in Newcastle, and uh, he just had they just had they had two children, he and his wife, and um, he was in the habit of when he did go away of phoning in the morning and in the evening so his wife could check that he was in his room and about to go to bed as opposed to out partying. And then um, he'd not phoned the night before, and so his wife got worried because this was unusual. So she phoned a friend of his and said, he's not phoned, could you go and check up on him? So his friend went to his hotel room, and the patient was um, on the floor, and it was clear that he'd had quite a lot of seizures. So he was quite unwell, and he was taken to the intensive care uh, unit in Newcastle. Uh, he was from Edinburgh, he was eventually transferred back up to Edinburgh. And latterly, when he was better, he told us that he'd been having headaches for about um, for a month or so. And in, more recently, he'd had some blurred vision as well. And he was, he was generally a very fit chap. There was no, um, nothing much in his past history. Um, he'd been a med he was in medical school. He'd been um, very well. He thought when he was a medical student, somebody had said to him that he'd had high blood pressure. But then latterly, they'd said, your blood pressure's fine. And he was on no, he was on no um, regular medications. He didn't smoke. He took... I'm going to say modest alcohol. He was a medical student, um, uh, and there was no there's no family history. Generally, a well chap. Um, and then when he came to the intensive care unit, I mean, he, he, they examined him, and the most notable thing, which I've highlighted in red, is his blood pressure was very high. So normally, blood pressure. I'm sure you many of you know this. The kind of blood pressure we say is normal is anything less than about 140 for the top reading which is what we call systolic blood pressure, and about 90 for the bottom reading. So his was in the order of 250 over 140, which is very, very high. Um, because he'd been fitting, and we don't really know how long he'd been fitting for, but he'd been fitting long enough that he dislocated both his shoulders. And he dislocated both his shoulders. He was also blind, and I'll come on to that in a minute. Well, we did know that his blood pressure was very high and he probably had high blood pressure for a while because one of the problems with high blood pressure and the reason we treat it is that it, it can cause damage to the heart, the, lung, uh, the eyes, the kidneys. And what we could see in him was that his, um, his eyes showed evidence of the blood pressure having been high for some time. So the way they managed him was essentially to control the blood pressure, first of all. And as they controlled the blood pressure and brought it down, which is quite difficult to begin with, his seizures stopped. So then his seizures stopped, his blood pressure gradually became under control. But he essentially, he remembered things from a while ago, but he couldn't remember what had been going on in the last few days. He, so what he had was what we call short-term retrograde amnesia. And he also was completely immobile because as you can imagine, he dislocated his shoulder, so he couldn't move the upper part of his body and he was blind. So this is really, I mean, as you can imagine, he was 35, his wife had come down from Edinburgh to Newcastle and they had two young children. It was a very upsetting time for everybody. His blood, we did some blood tests, and um, what, what his blood tests showed were that his, his kidneys weren't working very well. And I've shown the numbers here, but essentially his kidney function was in the order of about 20% of normal. Now, because he'd been very well, we didn't really have any blood tests before to know whether this was new or how long it had been on for. And we, he wasn't on renal patient view because uh, obviously he's not, he wasn't a patient. Um, so we didn't know how long this had been going on for. All we knew was that his kidneys were not working well at all. 
We also could see in his bloods that there was, his infl his, there was some inflammation going on in the body, which is not unusual when you have kidney impairment. It's not unusual when you've had, been having seizures, whether they're epileptic or not. And he just, generally, everything supported the fact that he'd been unwell, and, but we couldn't, still couldn't clarify how long he'd been unwell for. We knew that he would probably had high blood pressure for quite a long time, but that doesn't necessarily make you unwell. We also did then a tracing of the, heart, of the heart called an electrocardiogram or an ECG, which some of you might have had. And what this showed us was that there was definite evidence that he'd had strain on his heart for some time. So the heart, based on the tracing, showed that it was been under strain, so it was bigger. And we can tell this from these kind of tracings. And that was confirmed later when we did something called an echo, where you get ultrasound. You, it's ultrasound, you get some jolly, jelly on your, on your chest, and we can look at how the heart is um, pumping. And what that showed us was that the heart was more muscular than you might examine. And that's because the heart had been under pressure for a long time from high blood pressure. So I told you that he was blind. And partly because of that and partly because of the seizures, and we couldn't quite understand what was going on here, we did some brain scans. And he had a number of brain scans. He had a CT scan, which Tina mentioned earlier, and he also had an MRI scan. So this is the MRI scan. These, this is an MRI scan of the brain. So this is essentially taking a scan like this. These are the eyes. So this is the back of the brain. And normally the brain looks this kind of greyish colour and it looks pretty grey. I hope you can appreciate that there's kind of white areas here, these paler areas. So this is the back of the brain and this is the part of the brain that controls vision. And so what, we, what this gentleman had was abnormalities in the back of his brain in what we call the occipital cortex, which is where the brain controls vision. And so he was blind because there was dysfunction of the back of his brain in this area. And this, this is seen, often it is seen when blood pressure is very, very high. And this is often reversible. So what we could say to him was, we think that you're blind because you've got something called cortical blindness, which is where your brain is just not processing the signals correctly. But we are very hopeful that as the blood pressure falls, this should resolve, and it did. He regained his vision over a period of weeks as the blood pressure came down. So we also then imaged, and obviously I'm a kidney doctor, so we imaged his kidneys. So these are the kidneys. And these are the kidneys here, and th this is your left and right kidney. And there are two things that are abnormal here. Normally, these should look uh, kidney-shaped, and they should look uh, reasonably homogenous in colour. But what is abnormal here is they are very big, which you may not appreciate from this scan. They're very big, and they have lots of little, well, holes or cysts in them. So these kidneys are what we would call polycystic kidneys. They are big polycystic kidneys. And when you see these kind of kidneys, the first thing you think about is something called polycystic kidney disease, which is a genetic, it's one of the commonest genetic conditions affecting the kidneys. And so we thought he probably had, this was him presenting with kidney disease due to polycystic kidney disease. And high blood pressure, you might be aware, is actually a component of kidney disease. So when your kidneys don't work very well, you often get high blood pressure with it. And so we thought that what he was demonstrating was kidney disease that had not been diagnosed for a long time. And that associated with that, he had high blood pressure, which was then causing all of this. And what he was presenting with was this condition in the background, but then a sudden acceleration of the blood pressure, causing the blindness and the fitting. And so that was a likely diagnosis. So then what happened to him over the course of the next kind of few weeks? So this is a graph of what you see on this line is time. So that's from, this is in days. So it goes over a period of about three weeks, I think, so 20 days. And what you see along the, the vertical line is the kidney function. And as you go to the top of the vertical line, so numbers of four and five, kidney function is very bad. So he came to us with bad kidney function. And actually, over the next kind of week or so, you can see his kidney function got a lot better. And the reason for that probably was that we controlled his blood pressure. So when he came to us, I told you that his blood pressure was ridiculously high, 250 over 140. Normally, we like 140 over 90 for those numbers. And you can see that as we started drugs, some of you may be on these drugs, for blood pressure, the blood pressure gradually fell and we got control of the blood pressure. And as blood pressure fell, kidney function improved. We required to give him quite a lot of drugs to do this. And as Tina mentioned, it's almost as if I'd set up Tina to say all the right things before my talk. We then gave him something called Ramapril. So Ramapril is a drug called an ACE inhibitor, which kidney doctors love. It's very good for controlling blood pressure and it helps treat, it helps reduce the risk of kidney disease progressing. So we then gave him this drug, Ramapril, to help control the blood pressure because we hadn't quite achieved the numbers that we'd like for the blood pressure. One of the things you sometimes see with these drugs is that your kidney function can get a bit worse. 
And as long as it only gets a bit worse and stays stable, we say that's fine. Actually, the benefit of these drugs is much greater, even if the kidney function gets a bit worse afterwards. So you can see that this is the kidney function in the red dots. We started the ramipril, and the kidney function got a bit worse, as we might expect. And then it kind of remained a bit stable. So we thought, that's fine. His kidney function has got a bit worse. We often see this. But it's stable. As long as blood pressure is better, which we're now at the numbers we like, we're going to continue the drug. But what happened was that it got a bit worse, but then it got a bit worse again. And we were now getting, we were now getting a bit nervous because whilst we were getting the blood pressure to where we wanted, the kidney function was getting a bit worse. And if the kidney function continued to get worse, we're in the levels of thinking about things like dialysis and transplant. So we were trying to work out what should we do about this drug? Should we stop it? Should we continue it? What's, what's worse here, controlling the blood pressure or the kidney function? And actually, there was no consensus on this. I decided that I would just stop the drug because I was more nervous. I, th I thought I could control the blood pressure in other ways. So I stopped the drug. And you can see that when we stopped the drug, it got a bit better, the kidney function. But his blood pressure wasn't great. His blood pressure was higher than you'd like. So then the kidney function remained abnormal. His blood pressure was high. And I tried to control, and I, I am, I'm a hypertension doctor as well, and I did all my research in high blood pressure. And I had him on five drugs, and I was getting to the point of using drugs that we, don't, we rarely use for blood pressure, and I still could not get his blood pressure to where I wanted. And it's quite unusual to see blood pressures of those levels on five drugs. We often, as doctors, we often think, well, is the patient taking the drug? And sometimes what we used to do in the old days, we'd bring patients into hospital and give them the drugs so we could watch people, the people take the drugs and often the blood pressure would fall. But we knew he was taking the drugs and his blood pressure was still high. So then we thought, well, why is this? And often in this setting, you think, well, is there something else going on here that we're just missing? It'd be very, he'd be very unlucky. I mean, he's already got polycystic kidney disease, high blood pressure, he's gone blind, he's dislocated his shoulders he'd be very unlucky to have something else. So then we, we had this discussion, this was about 10 years ago, we had a discussion, well, what should we do? Should we, should we look for something else? I mean, he'd be very unlucky to have another rare cause of uh, high blood pressure. Given where we are, we decided anyway that we would. So what I'm gonna show you now is an MRI scan of the, um, this blood vessel is the main blood vessel in the body. And this blood vessel is called the aorta. These vessels here, and I, again, I, I'm not sure how well they project, are the two, blood vessels supplying the kidney and I don't know if you can appreciate the other thing these so this main blood vessel goes down here and then it splits into the blood vessels supplying the legs and this is the split here now normally these blood vessels are they're pretty much like a tube and straight down maybe you can appreciate that these are quite tortuous and quite bendy vessels so he had quite bendy vessels and the other thing he had if I just scroll through this again I hope you can see that this blood vessel supplying this kidney is pretty much non-existent. There is nothing coming off there and then it's there, suggesting that there is an interruption to this blood supply in some way. I'm just looking at the time. I appreciate I'm eating into other, people's, um, into, into other people's time. So essentially he had a blockage to one of the main blood vessels supplying the kidney. And what we thought on this scan was that he might have a minor blockage on the other side as well, which actually when we did scans following this, we couldn't see. So we were then, we then did something called an angiogram, which as Tina said, is where we give dyes to essentially highlight the blood vessels. And what we could see was essentially the blood vessel supplying this kidney was very narrow. And after this narrowing, you got this kind of ballooning of the blood vessel. So then we were stuck with what's this due to? We you often see narrowing of blood vessels due to what we call atherosclerosis, which is in patients who over many years get furring of their blood vessels due to things like high blood pressure, smoking. But this gentleman was young, he'd never smoked, and actually the rest of his blood vessels looked very clean. There was no furring of the blood vessels elsewhere. So we thought this was unlikely. And then it was the other, other things that might cause this, which I, look after, which I look after, and I said, this is definitely not due to the other kinds of conditions I look after. So then we thought, this is due to FMD. So I'm not going to go into the kind of ins and outs of FMD that Tina has essentially highlighted about who it affects. Many of you know this anyway, and when it might present and what its complications are. Tina also mentioned helpfully about pa most patients with kidney FMD tend to have what we call the multifocal, where lots of bits are affected. He was unlucky. He had the unifocal, so it affected one bit of it. 
And he was also, you know, he was early in the age of diagnosis. He was 35, and he was a man. So then the question was, well, what do we do about this? I mean, we could do nothing. Uh, we could try and control his blood pressure, but I had failed already. Or we could try and intervene on this. And again, Tina very kindly um, suggested that we could do something. We could balloon the blood vessel up. And so we had the discussion. Again, this was such a long time ago. At that time, it was unclear whether you could stent blood vessels, so put a tube in to uh, hold it open, or to put a balloon down and gradually inflate the balloon to do something called angioplasty. And for the reasons that Tina suggested, we did the angioplasty. And so we did the... Um, so again, I'm not going to go into this study, which is, um, which is the coral study that Tina mentioned about when, with, um, when patients with kidney blood vessels that are narrowed, how we might manage it. So what we did was we did angioplasty in this patient. And the, we did, so this is the, uh, these are the images from the day of the angioplasty. And you can see here, this is the blood vessel. This is what we call the catheter going down. And you can see the narrowing there. And then we do the angioplasty, and that is that is the effect of the angioplasty afterwards. Can you appreciate that, that the narrow blood vessels is increasing in size? So now this kidney is getting, blood, is getting blood. Now, kidneys simply produce we. And when kidneys don't work, there tends to be less we production. We did this, and in the next 24 hours, because he came into hospital, he, he passed 23 litres of we. And from a medical point of view, that's told us that this was probably important. The blockage that we were unblocking was really important. He did not like the fact that he, uh, A, had to pass 23 litres of urine and um, that he had to come into hospital for this. So what did, what did this result in? So this, again, is time. Now, this is time, whereas previously it was three weeks. This is now days over, up to about three years. And that's his kidney function again. So bad kidney function at the top, good fun kidney function at the bottom. We did the uh, unblocking here. And this is his kidney function since then. So his kidney function remains stable. So this was 10 years ago, and this was up to about three or four years afterwards. And this is what happened to his blood pressure. So you can see, before we did the unblocking, the blood pressure I'd struggled to get on top of. And gradually, the blood pressure fell to ridiculously healthy levels, almost better than mine. <laughs> and whereas previously, with bad, bad, bad levels of blood pressure, I had him on five drugs. He was then managed on one drug alone. So what this allowed us to do was, A, to maintain his kidney function, but also, more importantly, control his blood pressure with a single, the most kidney-protective, heart-protective, brain-protective agent we have. So the reason this was unusual is that this was, a young, this was a young gentleman presenting with FMD, but on the background of something far more common, which is still rare, called polycystic kidney disease. And we managed him uh, with the angioplasty, which allowed us to then preserve his kidney function and to manage his blood pressure. So with that, I am going to stop. Yeah,